this is, it's a little bit scary when I'm talking about a sort of a, an exciting scary, like you're walking on water. It seemed that I'm speaking every day almost. Just a few days in a week I don't speak somewhere in the United States. And this is in the last four or five months. I'm speaking at the, to the people at the proper time on the subject that is relevant to their own pursuit at the right time. Uh, and this is every day. And I feel like I'm I'm mysteriously there at that moment. Uh, and to be here this morning at this planning of this congregation, a church at this time in the history of the world when truth has become what I said it, truth is, truth has become what I believe about it. Truth has become what I want it to be and what I think it is. And we don't reduce truth down to that. In fact, a lot of places I go, even before they say anything in the church, when the preacher get up, he will say, say amen, which means that you're supposed to believe what he already thinks, and you are saying that, that is, that's what amen is, that that's absolute truth, before you even know what it is. And it's becoming a slogan in the church. Uh, uh, say what I say. It is like Satan has sent a, a strong delusion so that people may believe a lie instead of the truth. What that scripture is spoken of in relationship to God's getting ready to judge his people. Because people are gonna believe a lie instead of the truth, so they all might be damned. And that we are acting that way. Right is what I want it to be. Wrong is what you don't want me to believe and to do. And so we are facing a truth struggle. I, I think Pilate asked a powerful question. I think we think it was a ridiculing question when he asked, what is truth? The biblical idea is that the church is, and Jesus Christ's body the incarnated God in Jesus Christ was a manifestation of truth. That's the ultimate of truth. That he is the source of truth. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And Jesus says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, behold, I bring you good news. Which is this good news? Good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you, them, was born this night in the city of David, a Savior, the incarnated God, who is to be Lord. That is truth. And so this morning, I'm asking the question, really then, what is truth on the side? But asking, what is the church? And the church is to be the ongoing revelation of truth. It's to be the ongoing manifestation of truth. The church is to be the continuation of the crucified, resurrected Savior and Lord. And the church is the continuation, the replacement of God incarnated on earth in a community. As he was, so are we in the world. And we have relegated the church to what we want God to do for us. And the biblical thought is that God has already done everything that is necessary for us to be his body here on earth. And so we are not serving God for what we can get. And that's what the church today has become. The church has become primarily my prosperity institution to meet my needs. And the church was left here on earth to reflect and to do the will of God on earth. And we have made it a building and we have made it a felt need to meet my need institution. And so the church has become an extension of individualism, selfish, and greed. Sin is defined in the Bible as my own selfish desire. We need to talk about now an authentic, truthful expression of the church on earth. Then Jesus talked about the church in his life on earth. See, the church was to replace him. The church was, I will be with you. I will come again. I will live within you. And then I'll never leave you, not forsake you. Go to Jerusalem and wait there until we get this power from on high. And the idea of Pentecost was that the eternal God who had been incarnated in Jesus of Nazareth, had walked on earth, had been crucified, revealed God. Great, Paul said, is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, walked here on earth, was crucified, buried, and God raised him from the dead and ascended to heaven. And on the day of Pentecost, he came to live within us, he came to live among us. And living within us is not the full, complete expression of the Holy Spirit. It is like the, yes, it's the Spirit. It's the Spirit, but it's like our assurance that we belong to God. It's like the down payment. The fullness of that spirit manifested is when two or three gather together in his name at a given place and is working for the unity so that the power may be released collectively in that neighborhood on those people. And we would not have the fulfillment, the fullness of that power unless we was acting in unity, acting as a collective power. And most people think that they are almost the church as a unit, like people almost think that they are God as a unit, and that they have the fullness of God. That's why they do funny behavior, because they're trying to make you mean believe that they are all that is needed, is come back within them. No, we need each other to maintain the unity of the body. You're not even a church. 
unless there is some unity within the body. The church here is the body of Christ. It is the members in particular as they live together, seeing the needs and the issues and witnessing to those needs and issues, not allowing the church to become one issue point driven, even as it's abortion, even as it's homosexuality, even as it all those things, you make a church out of that and you're making an inferior, you're making not a complete model. The church is supposed to deal with issues, not be defined by issues. We have to take on issues. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We have taken that to mean that the church is a fortress and the enemy is outside knocking on the door and the church can keep the enemy out. And we talk about the gates of hell. That's not the thought. The thought is that the gates of hell is there, but we are storming it. We are going into the world, confronting the poverty, the ignorance, the crime, and the violence in the world. The church is a moving force. The church is a counter-revolution in the world. There's a revolution taking place in the world, and we are part of that revolution. His truth, the church, is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And the truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. And we, this world system, have become a system of individualism, materialistic, where we have deified money in our society. And it becomes our own means of personal prosperity. And so we got to come back. We got to take a look at it. I'm this concept here, I, I don't know. I don't know yet, and I don't want to condemn them. I'm, I am not somebody who go around condemning too much. I'm not preaching condemnation. I'm not preaching hate, but that's what the church is bought down as, as institution. That's what our bigger institution, that's what the, the, the Republican, Democrat, Republican, and Tea Party, they can't help nobody but themselves because it takes too much money to get elected. And they become the best people that money can buy. But we have deified it. We've deified it in our society. And so all they can do is help themselves in the world. And you're looking to them, you're looking at the wrong place. You're looking at the wrong place. I, I think we gotta come back and look at the church. And then we got to look in each other's face and talk truth to each other. Each other's face. You know, the biblical thought is the nearest that you can see God in this world is looking in each other's face. That's the great biblical truth in the Bible because we was created in the image of God, which means that we are looking glass for God. The biblical thought is the greatest event that's going to happen in the history of the world in front of us the big one has already happened. The big one already happened when he died on the cross. That was the big one. The next big one is when we see his face. Face to face, we shall behold him. Face to face, we, beloved, now you are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what you shall be, but you shall be like him when he appear, for you shall see him as he is, and he that has this hope in him looks for him, expect him to come. And someday, someday we're going to see his face. But in the meantime, I'm to look at you. 
I'm to look at you as a bearer of the light and the image of God that he has lightened every person that comes into the world. And all of us have a light. I love this little song. Every soul has a candle inside. Some is darkly burning. Some is dark and cold. God wants us to, and there's a spirit that ignites that light. And that spirit makes it home in you. And what God wants us to do, take our account, run to the darkness, seek out the hopeless, the despair, and warn. Hold out your count for all to see it. Take your count. Go light the world. The church is here to be the light of the world, to be the hope of the world. This is the truth. This is the truth. Now with me personally, when somebody come up to me too quickly and tell me that they got the completeness of the truth, I don't believe them. I get afraid of them. Because God has not totally committed to totality of his truth to an individual. He committed the church to a collective body of people, to the saints, to the elders. And the truth is to be sought out in a collectiveness. We have to come together. We have to be seeking out more and more and learning more and more about him until we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God, that he might be the perfect person that we are looking at. He is the perfect person. But we got to get to know him. Learn of me. Learn of me. The church is God's powerful unit on earth to do God's will. So why are we failing? Why are we failing? Uh, I think we think that bigness equal effectiveness. And I think that we think if we get bigger, we're going to be more effective. What I have found out to get bigger is to magnify the error bigger. <laughs> to make it bigger, enlargement, without it being effective, is not healing the world. And so we got these mega church. I'm not fighting them. I believe we could help them. I believe if they become home groups and break themselves up in zip code numbers and become the church in their neighborhood where they live, I think they could be effective and they could impact the world. And that we can engage all of these people and that we got enough people to revolutionize the world. But this individualism and this concept of bigness is the same as effectiveness don't equal to truth in our world. I think it also removes the people from their home neighborhood. I think it stopped them from carrying out the great commandment, loving, the, loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and then loving your neighbor, you love yourself. You don't have neighbors. You have a collective place we go, and that is a church. And the coming together of those collective units in the community. The take over. And so I'm for today creating churches, particularly in those neglected communities where those folks have been neglected. Those who didn't have the clothes and the dress and the automobiles and the resources to commute 20 miles somewhere else, that we need to have a congregation in those neighborhoods reaching those people there in that community. Because true religion, true religion, and under fire before God, the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep oneself unspotted before the world. The evidence of our effectiveness is our effectiveness reaching the poor. The poor who have been shut outside of the main economy of life and it becomes our responsibility to reflect God there. And I find that the bigger these churches become, the more middle class they become. 
in the society. And the preachers then themselves have to reflect that in all of their behavior. And the little people might feel too inferior. They might feel like they don't have what it takes. And on the other hand, the congregation, even this worship, what is it, beautiful. There is beautiful worship in these huge churches. I love that beautiful worship. But it's put on by professionals, and it's becoming more professional in the world. And I know in the ghetto, and I know in the black urban community, we wouldn't have all of these people these musicians. We wouldn't have Anita Franklin. We wouldn't have all of those folks. We wouldn't have Mahalia Jackson. We wouldn't have had Lentine Pride unless she sung those songs in Sunday schools in the church. We wouldn't have the former, these first black congressmen who most of us all preachers or grew up in the church like Lewis and all of those guys because they was in the church. This is where their skills and their uplift took place in those neighborhoods, in those communities. Now we are getting only those who can go to Harvard or somewhere else. I love Harvard. I'm not against it. I, don't get me confused. I am not here preaching against something. I'm preaching for something. I'm preaching here that we can make a difference. I'm saying that there are some ways and there are some means by which the church can become the church in the community. I remember I was doing a tour of Germany a long time ago, back in the 60s. I was doing a tour of Germany, and I was speaking to the church all over Germany. They invited me to come. And in Germany, and they knew about me, they had heard about me in Mississippi. They had heard about what we was trying to do down there, and they wanted to identify with you. Always your good host wants to identify with their, with their, with their guests so that they can uh, have some relevant conversation with the guest. And I remember when I would go to a town, they would, we, I would they would talk about, they would know who I was and what I came to see and what I was doing in Germany. They had to go back a hundred years to tell me when some noble lady, queen, had left the palace and went down and lived with the poor, lived with the poor. The church had memories of time when it was the church. When it was the church, it was the church when it was identifying with the broken in our society. I wouldn't be surprised that we're gonna have 50 years from now, they'll have to look back, look back hard to try to find. Maybe they could remember Martin Luther King giving his life for the garbage workers. That's why we know him. That's why we know him. He was nothing but a little kind, little city preacher, you know, nothing but a little philosopher. But when he got involved trying to help a lady, a black seamster, who couldn't ride on the seat of the bus and paid her fare, an old grandmother, he identified with the poor, and we remember him for that. Maybe. May we remember Mandela, who was locked in jail for being a terrorist. And about 10 years in there, they wanted to let him out. They wanted they could see that he would become more popular in jail. Then he was going to be a bit more dangerous in jail than it was that would be out. And so they wanted to get him out. They met with him and said, if you renounce terrorism, uh, we'll let you out. He said, I, I don't want to be no terrorist, <laughs> but I can't make you that promise in the pursuit of freedom. Freedom is a little bit more important. Life, he had found something to die for. He was ready to live. What we have done, our, our commitment and our passion has been, have been uh, dumbed down because of materialism. People just want enough of God to get through. They want a God that can pay their rent. They want a God that can meet their uh, 
You think they want a God, some of them, that could help me have a Bentley to drive? And if you give me your money, send it to me, I will guarantee you, you could be like me. Which is the biggest lie in the world. Most people can't be like me. I sleep four hours a night, and I spend the other nights thinking about what I'm going to do. Most people I know who was poor sleep too many hours. They haven't committed, they haven't found nothing to get them up. They haven't got a cause to have any meaning. And if that cause in it is a cause, it's limited to themselves. And they think they can only make it. They can only make it. Human beings can do more than that. Human being is called to serve others. If anyone come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I know that personal. All of my problems and conflicts have been basically my own doing. I don't need too much focus on John Perkins. The focus need to be on him. Focus need to be on him. And he said, if you put your focus on him, you will have those things. We got it backwards. Forget about yourself. Concentrate in him. Anyone who come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. That's not an abandonment of self. That's putting yourself in the will of God. That putting yourself in a place where you can do more. You're not seeking your own needs. It is more blessed to give and to share than to receive. It is only in blessing, it is only in sharing with others that God's blessings flow back to you in the world. That is a biblical truth in the scripture. And so the church, so the church today. And so I want to see I want to see. I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of churches who see themselves as church planning churches. You see, the church, what well, the early church, the early church, God had to scatter the first Jewish church. He had to scatter it through persecution. And in that persecution, they ended up in Antioch. And at that Antioch church, they had a bigger vision. The Apostle Paul came there, and he was probably studying what he finally wrote to the Ephesians, explaining the church, what he probably wrote to the uh, church at Corinth in chapter 12, where he explained the church is a collectiveness, it's the body of Christ. What he wrote to the Romans, which he put in chapter 12, and what the church was to be a steward of this wonderful truth and carry this truth to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the world. The mission of the church is the mission of planting other churches in neighborhood, but planting churches that love in words and in deeds. If they see the poor, talk about jobs and opportunity. If they see the lonely and the hurting to start hospitals and clinics, in those neighborhoods for those people who have the problems in the neighborhood and the historic schools. The church have been there. All of the hospitals in my early days, 80 years ago, it was either a Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or Jewish. It was a hospital. And we lost all of that. We didn't commercialize all of that in our society. We got to do that again. We got to do that again. The church has got to become the church that has the eyes. He that has eyes to see, let him see. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And enter into the pain and the agony of the people because it's in pain and agony that you find solutions to problem. You don't do that in prosperity. We became so prosperous that we allowed one street in New York to bring the greatest oppression on this nation since the Great Depression. And that had nothing to do with nothing but greed. And you don't hear the church saying a word about it. 
You don't have the church center worried about it. And it. Ain't nothing went wrong with nobody out here. Ain't nothing went wrong with the production line. Nothing has went wrong but those selfish people. The Lehman Brothers president got $500 million one year in the salary when his company was going busted. You don't hear nothing about it. And he's walking around free. That's a crime. That's evil. If an old black lady would have stole a food stamp, you would have heard all about it. They'd have made a marker out of that. They'd have made a marker out of that. And you don't hear Fox talking about that. You don't hear those talking heads talking about that in our society. The church have lost. The church today is the church of letter to see us. It says that it's rich. It says that it has need of nothing, but not understanding that it's miserable and it's poor. And God says for us to go and buy something that's pure, get something that's truth, become the right, put on the righteous robe of God and to go out and be witnesses. And I can tell you how you can put on that robe. And I'll tell you how you can put it on every morning when you get up. Get up in the morning and ask God to forgive you for your sins and go to bed at night and ask God to forgive you for your sins. He's faithful and he's just. And if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not on you. God wants you to walk in his righteous robe. You have no rights of your own. You gotta, but you've got to keep that robe clean. You've got to keep that robe clean by confessing your sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. One of the things that worry me today as I go out today to speak is people are so self-centered that somebody in this room now is listening for one mistake I said. I didn't say it right because I don't speak English. If I could speak in tongue, I would ask God to give me English. I speak Ebony. I'm just trying to make an excuse for you guys to don't go out and get hung on the nothingness. I think we need to be looking for truth. We'd be looking for truth. The truth that we can walk by, we need to be learning from Jesus. And that we need to be confirming Galatians 5, 25 and on, where our lives reflect those virtues. And so what is the main task of this church? I've told you, where do you begin at? You begin by discipling people. You begin by discipling people so they can become just leaders, so they can know what's right and what's wrong. Because at this point, they don't understand that. It's what I want is right. It's what I want is right. That's why you got to forget about yourself. That's why you got to forget about yourself. You're going to open yourself up for learning. That's what repenting is. And it wasn't because it's hard today. People won't allow themselves to, be rep to repent. Because repenting is to make you conscious of your sins sin. And the day you make people conscious of sin, they'll join another church where they don't do that. Where they don't do that. And they'll join a bigger one where the message will be gentle. And it won't touch them. That's the whole idea of the preaching of the gospel. Is the spirit of God might take that word of God and bring conviction of sin and then you might confess that sin and be healed and do the work of God uh, in this world. When Jesus came into the world, he got some disciples. And you and I know about God because of the discipleship work. I could tell you about this epistle that we read this morning. Now, all the epistles in the Bible, uh, the, the epistles in the Bible is about the church. Is about the church, basically. Especially Paul's epistles. They're either written to a local church or they're, or they're written to an individual who's in charge of the church, who has a church in their home or who is a superintendent 
an overseer of the church and society. And so that passage we read this morning is a very uh, powerful passage in the sense that we are to come together to worship like we did this morning, to encourage each other, to be equipped, to express our gifts to each other and to serve each other, to be equipped to go out and to do the ministry. Yes, to worship God. But worshiping God should be all gratitude, all gratitude, magnifying him, thanking him, praising him, and then sometimes moaning, moaning for the aches of the society, agonizing for his presence in the society. And then the real music in the Bible, the real music in the Bible is really the compoundness of truth when truth come together. That's, music is the most powerful force where it used for good or for bad. Because for bad, it compound what is wrong. And for, tr- and for tr- biblical, it compound what is good and wholesome. And so whenever there is a compound truth, when the prophet is saying something that is so truthful and puts it so in order, it becomes music. And that's where music comes from. The first time we got music is when God did his big thing in redeeming his people out of Egypt. And when they got on the other side redeemed, they began to talk about what God did for them, what they had watched God do for them, and they put it into music. And when the prophet Isaiah began to think about the redemptive work that Jesus was going to come and do, that he was going to be the root out of the dry ground, Isaiah put that to music. He said, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, the government should be on his shoulder, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government and kingdom there shall be no end. That's music. When Jesus is trying to explain to Nicodemus what it means to be born again. You can't enter into your mother's womb and be born again a second time. What do all this mean? Jesus broke into music. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He that believes not on him is condemned already because they believe not on the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And a man loves darkness rather than night. That's music. And when you raise a question about how much God loves us when he saves us, and how can we be separated? Says, nothing, 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 nothing can separate you. Death, life, principalities, things present, things to come, nothing. That's music. That's truth. That's truth. What a great Savior we have. What the church could be. What the church could be. But, um, but the people I'm meeting today just want just enough for the church to keep their respectability. They want just enough for the church to give them some kind of good standing in society. We have lost passion. We've lost passion. But if the church kept the passion, if you find revival in the Bible or in history, you'll find people burning with passion. You'll find Wilberford. You'll find John Wesley. You'll find Martin Luther. You'll find people who are burning with flame. Flame. You'll even find Billy Graham. I hope I could be remembered that way. I hope I could be remembered that I found truth in Jesus Christ and I wanted to know more about him. And I was a truth seeker in the world. And I want to say that I didn't cave in. I didn't cave in. I didn't cave in. Because he says, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give you a, a crown of life. And so I say to you folks here, do it. Do it. Get 150 people in this congregation and do it again. And get another 150 and do it again. 
And that other one that's got 150, they will do it again. They will do it again. Let's become the body of Christ in the most darkest places. Let's let our light shine in the darkness. And let's shed ourselves of some of our consumerism so we can have power. So we can have power. Because where our treasures are, there will our heart be also. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, man, I can hear Jeremiah say, he, for this church, I have a plan for your life. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hurt you. You're not going to go bust it. You're not you're going to go bust it. I have a plan for you, a plan for good. I have a plan for your healing. I have a plan for your prosperity. I love you. I love you. There are they that sow us, but yet increases. There are they that hold back too much, and all of that turns to nothing. Oh, Lord, I just wish people would give themselves to God. I wish they could trust this living God, this living God, and give their life to him. There might be people in this room here who would like to do that. Oh, man, who would like to do that? like to give their life completely to God. I better yet want to ask, how can I do that? I really think it's a process. I think the will began, and people have to begin to show you how to do it, because you do need to be responsible. You need to be responsible. You need to be a good steward of what God has given you, and be a good steward of your life. There'll be some people here today who'd like to talk to you about that. That's the way we're going to be. People who want to commit. This is, I don't know whether or not they want this as a place of just absolute comfort. I don't know if they want this to be a place of neither hot nor cold. And if you're cold, you will seek some shelter. If you're hot, you want to do something with it. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful gathering of people. Bless this movement. Bless these people. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I don't have to say anything else about me being here. It's uh, absolutely my joy. And it's something to feel like that you are walking in the, in the will of God. That's some kind of a, a great energy uh, feeling. Somebody came to me when I walked in and they said, uh, we are just so happy. And they were saying it with thrill. And I was saying back to them, what a joy that you would invite me at this time in, in the history of the church in our nation. And so I just, let's do it. Let's, let's trust the Lord. Let's do it together. Let's be his people here on earth. Let's pray. Now may the, the God that makes peace, that brings us peace, may the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make us diligent, excellent in every good work. As he work in us and through us and out of us, that which is well pleasing in his sight for his glory and our good. Amen.